All right. Assalamu alaikum, ayubowan, wanakam, good evening to you all. I warmly welcome you all to this new webinar series entitled A Million Dreams, Stories to Inspire and Motivate from the leaders in informative online events, RPSL Consortium. Today, we kickstart this series with our first guest, who I assure you will completely keep you transfixed. On behalf of RPSL Consortium, I will be in conversation this evening with a name that needs no introduction, Jayanti Kuru Tambal. May I begin by thanking you all for joining us on this beautiful Thursday evening. And let me take this opportunity to inform you that this is the first in this series and we hope to bring you a new story to inspire and motivate each month. Many of you may be wondering what or who RPSL is. Let me introduce you to the chairperson of the Women's Empowerment Sectoral Committee of RPSL. Over to you, Professor Faziha Azim. Thank you very much, uh, Sister Tassi. Yeah, very good evening to you all. On behalf of the RPSL and its women empowerment sector, it's with special excitement that I am pleased to welcome our guest, Jayanti Koro Tampula to this valuable discussion. We are delighted to have with us, in, we are delighted to have you with us on this evening. You are, have proved that women can take up spaces anywhere. And you also have challenged the stereotypes that exist in our societies. We know your journey towards success was not a journey overnight, but it's a result of your hard work, dedication, strength, patience, and the efforts that you have put up. And you also have risked yourself to bring glory to our nation. We are very delighted to know about your involvement in women's rights issues related to SGBV, community work, motivational speeches, and so on and so forth. You are an all-rounder, Jayanti. I'm not going to give a lengthy introduction to Jayanti as she doesn't need actually, but Tassi is formally uh, assigned the task to do the introduction and she will continue. Okay, now uh, I will give a brief introduction to our PSL before I hand over the discussion to Tassie. As the chairperson of women's empowerment sector, it is my duty to introduce the RPSL consortium. RPSL stands for Regain Peace Sri Lanka. It is a registered company that works towards bringing peace in Sri Lanka through community empowerment, appreciating diversity, educating youth, creating intra-community dialogue, strengthening ethnic harmony and national reconciliation, promoting environmental sustainability, supporting the government initiatives in peace building and strengthening national and international collaboration in the path. RPSL has six dedicated sectors to achieve its aims and execute its projects. I'm very happy to introduce our president, Mr. Shabri Halimdin, who is the captain of our ship, and Dr. Shamila Dawood, who serves as the secretary general to the forum. I also want to introduce Mrs. Shana Sakin, who is the vice chairperson of the Women's Empowerment Committee, and Zaytun Hakim, who is our secretary. And our patron, Mr. Sai Panipa. I would say he is the live wire of RPSL, who has given us continuous support and motivation throughout our journey in the forum. I also would say he is the compass of this shape. I also want to introduce Professor Aslam and the Wazir Mukta, who are cornerstones in our consortium. And let me introduce uh, the women's empowerment sector. As I told you, it's, it's one of the most dynamic sector in the consortium. The purpose of the sector is to empower women in the community in different spheres, for example, social, economic, political, and cultural through suitable strategies. The successful strategies are expected to create individual and collective empowerment of women to live a decent life in our community and increase their participation in the community development and contribute to peace, peaceful living. And let me briefly outline the committee's task. First is uh, we are planning to carry out situational analysis to find out problems faced by various categories of women in our country. 
And then also we are trying to network with existing women's committee and form new committee as focal yes, points. And we are also planning to identify challenges faced by women through focal points. And our long-term target is to set up a database uh, through the RPSL forum based on the existing issues and the resources that we have. And then we are also planning to document successful pre-existing programs on women's empowerment. That's where we are trying to learn from the success stories. And further, we are also planning to identify issues, opportunities, and challenges through meetings, discussions, and workshops. We've been doing this for a long time. And then we are also trying to identify collaborators to engage in research or action plans in critical areas that we have identified. And I must say that during the last couple of years, with all the difficulties that our, the country went through and currently we are going through, we were able to conduct several programs by our committee as part of our strategies. However, all these programs were not without challenges. And then uh, actually I want to, I don't want to take much of your time. This is a brief introduction to our sector. As uh, Sister Tassie told that this is one of the program in our series, especially targeting uh, successful people in our community. So we are really delighted to have Jayanti today with us. And I kindly ask you to join me in welcoming Jayanti on behalf of our RPSL. Thank you very much, Jayanti, for your presence. And now I'm handing over the mic to Tessie. Please, Tessie. Thank you so much, Professor Vaziha. Your encouraging insight was a great platform to begin our program this evening. So a quick explanation about the proceedings this evening. After we hear from our guest, you, the audience, will be able to ask your burning questions. You may use the chat feature to ask your questions and we will look at them during the Q&A session later on. So moving on, each of us here today has dreams. Some of us persevere, some of us don't. Some of us are determined, others are not. Some of us achieve the desired end result, others do not. In the words of the great Winston Churchill, success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. So what does it take to reach maximum potential without giving up? What does it take to completely conquer your fears and doubts and believe in yourself to make your dreams become reality? What better person to have with us today to answer these questions? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jayanti Kuru Tampala, an icon in Sri Lanka, a woman who dared, who was a risk taker, who defied all odds to achieve what no other Sri Lankan had accomplished before. Jayanti is a Sri Lankan adventurer, professional rock climber, motivational speaker, and women's rights activist. She's the first person from Sri Lanka to summit Mount Everest six years ago. This incredible feat she achieved on 21st May, 2016. Good evening, Jayanti, and thank you so much for joining us today. We are all so anxious to hear your incredible journey this evening. But let's start at the very beginning. Tell us a little bit about Jayanti as you were growing up. Thank you, Tassi. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, Wanakkam. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, to the RPSL for inviting me here today. Uh, so growing up, I guess I grew up, I had a very regular childhood. I grew up in Behivala. Um, I went to Bishop's College for my schooling and um, I really enjoyed tennis. I think my parents uh, um, exposed me to many sports and extracurricular activities. So tennis was something I picked up from grade three onwards, I think, and continued till I left school. Um, and subsequent to, I mean, after school, I went to uh, Delhi University where I did my degree in English literature and uh, came back to Sri Lanka and began working with a women's rights organization. And uh, that line of work hasn't changed since for the past 18 years, I suppose. <laughs> so that's in a nutshell, a very quick, brief uh, picture of growing up. 
um, for today. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Jayanti. So the Jayanti of today is a super confident lady who knows what she exactly needs to make the most of her time on earth. Were you always so self-assured? Absolutely not. <laughs> Uh, and it's interesting because um, many people actually say, oh, here's Jayanti who's fearless. She climbed Everest, she's fearless. And I keep saying, I keep telling people that I have many fears and uh, especially on Everest, there were many, many fears that I had to overcome. So I definitely am not fearless. And uh, I also, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I was never always confident or, you know, all of that. I, I think Everest taught me a lot. And what I love is that nature does not discriminate. And uh, Everest taught me so many life lessons that has changed me, which has changed the person I, I am today. And I'm grateful to that experience. Just muting. Um, Jayanti, you rose to fame with your quest to climb the tallest mountain in the world. and achieved what no other Sri Lankan had accomplished. Could you tell us a little bit about other important career highs that you had maybe prior to Mount Everest? Um, I guess I would pin it down to, let's say, uh, sometimes small things can also, you know, small steps help along the way. And for me, one of the big things I feel uh, was getting a World Bank scholarship to do my master's degree in gender studies. So by this time, before I went to do my master's, uh, that was in the UK. I had worked almost for about, uh, let's say, five or six years on women's rights and gender equality. So when I actually went to do my master's degree in the UK, what was amazing was that it was like uh, finding the missing pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. So I had got the practical experience working with the Women and Media Collective, a well-known women's rights organization. And then when I did my master's, that was sort of the theoretical pieces that came together to understand why we do things the way we do them. So that was for me, I think, just really helpful in my work and my career and has been helpful throughout in everything I've been doing since then. Yeah. I think that validation was so important. <laughs> yeah, and then the knowledge, I suppose, yeah, absolutely. So you seem to stand up for your rights and certainly do not believe that it's a man's world. Right? I hear your motto is questioning gender stereotypes. How did you convince your family and loved ones about your passion and dream to climb mountains? I mean, it's not the norm, right, in the average Sri Lankan home? Yeah, it's like, absolutely, it's not the norm. And I, I guess I wish it was the norm because that's probably why I also made it to the top of the world. But I was fortunate. My parents actually are the ones who encouraged me from a very young age when I would climb all the trees in my garden. Like we grew up in the Hivala and there was a mango tree, coconut trees, a gorva tree, uh, uh, wood apple tree, ali, ali pera tree, right? You know, the, the, the butter yeah. fruit tree. And uh, it yeah. was, yeah, so that was where the climbing actually began. And unlike many parents who would say, don't climb, you're going to fall and break your neck, or don't do this, especially as a girl, I actually had the opportunity to climb. And my father actually taught me. He said, okay, if you're going to climb, I'll teach you how to climb safely and come back down safely. So that is something I've carried with me throughout my life. And I think I've been very fortunate to have parents who encouraged, who did not believe in gender stereotypes, actually, who decided that that's really unnecessary. Even, for example, like the little, um, you know, at home, when you get little repairs, my dad would actually like to repair everything in the house. If anything <laughs> breaks, he would repair it. And I would be his uh, sort of little helper with the drill or the screwdrivers or, you know, uh, with the toolbox, so um, he didn't believe in these, neither did my mother actually, in these gender stereotypes. So I was very fortunate, actually. Yes, yes, yes. yes. that's lovely to know. It's always so important to have your parent support, and Absolutely. I think that's something that a lot of our youngsters need mm. nowadays. Absolutely. So, Jayanti, having reached the highest point in the world, I'm tempted to say, in your case, it's like, I've been there, done that. What are your plans for the future now that you've accomplished the unthinkable? What are you involved in now? What does your future hold? Share all of this with us. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I still think there's a lot more, many more mountains to climb, let's say, uh, metaphorically and literally as well. <laughs> uh, I think just uh, challenging gender stereotypes itself is probably a much tougher, more difficult mountain than Mount Everest. And I, I guess I will, that's also 
that area of work has been, I've been passionate about it because I am also a woman and I have had to face harassment, discrimination in various forms. And I feel for me also just, you know, whether it's on the street, particularly, you know, taking a bus to school, you know, every woman goes through this season of harassing the bus. And I think working to change that has been something that I have found challenging, but also rewarding when there are small gains made. Uh, so I have learned so much with the people who are making that journey. And so I will keep climbing and keep working on gender equality. Currently, my role is as an advisor, a co-creator of um, a little initiative called Delete Nothing, which actually deals with online gender-based violence, because we know that a lot of children and adults go through this, um, even in cases of domestic violence, there's lots of cases of online, you know, tech -related, technology related, blackmailing, uh, you know, uh, with the phones, asking for money. Cyberbullying, that sort of thing. Yes, cyberbullying, exactly. So we're trying to document cases um, and also provide support in all three languages to people who have experienced online gender-based violence um, and documenting also because there's no database of cases. So we want to understand the prevalence uh, and then also try and strengthen the response mechanism to make it also comprehensive um, so that victim survivors can uh, have better access to support uh, when they do uh, experience the online gender-based violence. Uh, Jati, could you just repeat the name of that uh, organization? It's, it's, yes, it's called Delete Nothing. Delete, Delete Nothing. Nothing. Yes, I can put it oh, in the chat box. It's, it's Delete Nothing yes. Nothing dot org. So you can check it out. It's it's got. Or if you can just share the link with us, that would be fantastic yes. for our. Yes. It's on the. I've just shared it. On the, Thank you so much. Chat. So I know you have an incredible story to share with us this evening, Jayanti. And I have listened to you before, and let me tell you, I was absolutely captivated. And that is why I wanted you to start off this new series for us, because I think you will be a great way to motivate us, to inspire us, to believe in our dreams, to achieve what we set out to do. So I'm really excited and looking forward to being mesmerized once again. So over to you, Jayanti motivate us and inspire us to reach for the stars. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tessie. Give me one moment just to fill up my, uh, I will share, my, I would, I'd like to share my screen. I've got a few slides to share with all of you. Uh, and don't worry, it's mostly photographs from the journey, just because I know it's quite hard sometimes to otherwise understand this entire journey as well. So can everyone see my screen at the moment? Oh, yes, Jayanti, yes. we can oh. see. Okay, fantastic, thank you. So, um, I mean, as with any journey, I'll try to start at the beginning, but that could take too long. But, um, hello, is this echoing? Okay, uh, yes. So, climbing Everest actually was not something that happened overnight, as Tassie rightly said in the beginning. And for me personally, this journey to climb this particular mountain, has actually been a childhood dream. It's something I wanted to do since I was about eight years old. And I know this sounds like a cliche, but it actually was the case. Um, but from that age, of course, you know, when people ask you, what do you want to do when you grow up? And many people, many, many, you know, as, as someone who's young, you're expected to have the correct answer, which would be to be a doctor, to be a lawyer, to be an engineer, or something fantastic like that not to climb a mountain, right? So this was not something I actually shared while growing up because it sounded too, too silly and it just sounded ridiculous. So it was something I carried with me throughout. And uh, fortunately, I ended up at Delhi University for my first degree in English literature. And that's when I was like, I realized, oh my goodness, I'm in the land of the Himalayas and I needed to go be in the mountains. And I remember once I finished my degree, my lecturer, one of my lecturers at uni actually told me about this mountaineering course, which is, which uh, actually it's a school set up by Tenzing Norgay, who was one of the first people to climb Everest in 1953. He and Tenzing Norgay uh, and Hillary, Edmund Hillary were the first two people to climb in 53. So he had set up this mountaineering school. So I packed my bags and I took off to the mountains and I realized also it was a one month course uh, also run by the army. So that was quite um, 
unusual, uh, but it was also boot camp training. Um, I think someone's scribbling on the screen. Is it Brian? Yes. Is that uh, maybe you might not be aware? You might. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so basically, so I took this course on, but because that taught me all the basics, I needed to get to the mountains and. I mean, in hindsight, this was where my training began to climb Everest in, back in 2003, right? So many years before Everest was in 2016. So there was also a preparation phase. And I would say the planning and preparation in a way began in 2003 because I learned everything about mountaineering, many things in one month there. The following year, I went back into the mountains, two years later actually, to do this advanced course. The same course had an advanced version, which I did it also because I didn't know anyone else who wanted to climb uh, with me. Uh, and then subsequently, I met my climbing partner in 2011, Johan Pires, not my husband. Many people assumed he was, he was my husband, but he's not. He's my climbing buddy, climbing partner. And uh, we were doing an expedition to Island Peak, which is another mountain in Nepal. And along the way, you could see Everest. So that's when I told him one day, I would love to climb Everest. Would you actually consider? Um, uh, climbing this with me and he actually agreed and I was thrilled that there was some another Sri Lankan who was as crazy as I was about uh, mountaineering so we decided we not needed to also figure out our teamwork and we thought let's climb another mountain Kilimanjaro uh, as you know the tallest in uh, Africa um, which we did together as a team and also successfully submitted and after that, we thought, okay, now let's attempt climbing Mount Everest. I think my screen has frozen. Let me see here. Okay. Sorry, I think there's a bit of a glitch on my laptop today. Okay. So what was important was before climbing the tallest mountain in the world, it was essential for us to also climb as a team together which we did in 2012 and climb also tallest, like taller mountains than the ones available in Sri Lanka. Uh, our mountains are beautiful and tall, but they are pimples compared to the mountains in the Himalayas. So climbing Island Peak and Kilimanjaro as a team, Rohan and I, uh, that was also quite essential. Then we had to actually do this training, um, like train from where we had to actually start working out together at least about for the two years before climbing Everest. And uh, I remember after the training, we did the process of also uh, asking for sponsorship for funds, uh, which wasn't easy. I remember a number of people actually telling me or telling Johan, they were probably too scared to tell it to my face, <laughs> but uh, they would tell Johan, you know, uh, why are you climbing Everest with a woman? She will fail and you will also fail, right? So they were, people were just shocked that since nobody in Sri Lanka had climbed this mountain, uh, how can a woman? Sorry. I'm just down and then pass. If you could all mute your microphone, please, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. So um, uh, yes, basically, these are the comments I had before climbing. So even with sponsorship, the challenges were, were it was such that because I'm a woman, there was this belief that I could actually do this, or or it was almost like. Jayanti, you are muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Is this audio? Uh, yes, audio now? Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, also, I think I'm wondering how to remove these scribbles from the screen. Is uh, Does the host know how to do that? Uh, maybe I'll share screen again with that help. That will, yeah. yeah. Let me just try, try sharing it. again, Jayanti, just to see. If yeah, that, uh, let me see. Oh, that's better. Yes, that's better. Uh, All right. that helps. Oh, that is a bit disturbing. <laughs> okay, so so many challenges along the way, even before getting to the mountain. That was actually what I was trying to get at here. Uh, right, so Everest can be climbed from two areas, from two sides, from Tibet in China or via Nepal. The more classic route that Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norge took was via Nepal. And that was a route that I was also, I had suggested that we do. So here we are on our way to Everest Base Camp. So it's a two week journey on foot to arrive at Everest Base Camp. You can see the path here and the bridges that we would cross. Uh, and here we have an aerial view of Mount Everest. 
in the far, the mountain, all the way at the back in the center of the, center of the screen is actually uh, Everest. But these little yellow dots at the bottom that you can see, so that actually is Everest Base Camp. So you kind of get a scale of what Base Camp looks like. It's massive. To walk from one end of Base Camp to the other end, it takes three hours at a minimum, right? So it's a very large area. And then we have something called the Kumbu Icefall, which is out here, which I will explain a little bit later. And then this is Mount Everest at the top. So once we get to base camp, actually our life changes forever once we're there. And what was uh, difficult was that, see the journey to Everest is actually a two month journey. It takes two weeks to reach base camp. And subsequently beyond base camp, the only thing you have around you is just ice, snow, and rock, right? Because at this altitude, at this height, at 17,500 feet, there are no trees. There's less oxygen. There's only 50% of oxygen that you have, wherever you are in Sri Lanka, we have 100% of oxygen. So imagine having half the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere. That was what it was like at base camp. The temperature was about minus 20 degrees Celsius. So cold, uninviting, inhabitable, inhospitable. But this was now going to be our home for the next one and a half months, right? This and beyond as we keep climbing up the mountain. So once we uh, actually uh, leave base camp, we have the Kumbu icefall that we have to pass through, which you have a photograph right here as well. Uh, it's one of the most beautiful areas, but also the most treacherous because you can see these giant blocks of ice. And when the sun comes out, of course, the ice begins to melt. And that's what causes avalanches. So we had to cross this Kumbu ice fall uh, by, at night, actually. We would leave early morning at 2 a.m. and get to the next camp, Camp 1, uh, by, before sunrise, by about 7 or 8 in the morning. Uh, so that itself was a challenge. The Kumbu ice fall has many sections where you need to cross vertically or horizontally. Uh, and there are ladders, sometimes five ladders tied together, some areas, and we have to cross these deep crevices. Uh, the picture on the right hand side, that's, uh, that's me crossing one of the crevices. So it's quite deep, you can't really see the bottom of the crevice. Multiple times we've been told uh, about how climbers have missed their footing and fallen into the crevice. And because you are wearing crampons on your boots, crampons are spikes that you need to climb on ice. Uh, so that you're not slipping and sliding all over the place. Uh, but sometimes when you take a tumble, the spikes can cut the safety rope and people have disappeared into the crevice forever. So, so it was quite scary in many, many ways, almost on a daily basis, but that was also part of the challenge. Now I want to take a quick minute here to explain why it takes two months to climb Mount Everest, because this is something that nobody in Sri Lanka, very few people, unless you're a mountaineer, understand. <laughs> Because of course, our mountains, any mountain, you can ascend in the same day and come back the same day. It's not a big, I mean, there are very challenging ones, but pretty much every mountain you can go up and come back the same day. Now on Everest though, going up and coming back the same day would be actually fatal. You will lose your life. It's not humanly possible. So instead, everyone who climbs this mountain needs to actually allow their body to accl acclimatize which means to allow your body to get used to the lower levels of oxygen that's in the atmosphere, the higher you go. Basically, getting you, your body has to get used to the thin air, right? So we started base camp, which you can see the triangle at the bottom. And then there's camp one, camp two, camp three, camp four, and then the summit. So unlike any journey, it's not a linear journey to the top. You don't just go base camp one, two, three, four, and top. No, because then you won't come back alive. But instead, we have to actually go from base camp. We go up to camp one. We spend one night there. And then we actually have to come back down to base camp. Then from base camp, we go to camp two. But once again, we go up to camp one for one night. We go up to camp two for one night and back down to base camp. Same with camp three, all the way up to camp one for one night, camp two for one night, camp three for one night, back down to camp two for one night, and all the way back down to base camp. So you might be thinking, what, what's this nonsense? Like, this is crazy. Why, why would anyone do this? So actually, there is a scientific reason behind this. Because camp three has only 30% of oxygen in the atmosphere. 
base camp has a 50% oxygen. But we can climb from base camp to camp three without using supplementary oxygen when we climb up and down multiple times like this. What happens is that our bodies naturally, naturally produce more red blood cells, more hemoglobin, which means even though there's less oxygen, we have more circulation and oxygenated blood in our system because our body is adapting. So that was a process that anyone and everyone climbing this mountain has, has to follow. And only once you reach, that itself takes one month up and down multiple times. Uh, and uh, the most challenging bit was that between each camp, they would give us a time limit. Like for example, they would say from base camp to camp one, you have seven hours. And from camp two to camp three, it's nine hours. And if you do not make it within the stipulated amount of time, uh, they do give you the company that you go with. We go with a, mount, a reputed mountaineering company, a guiding company. But if you don't make it in your first attempt to reach that next camp within the amount of time they give you, you're given a second chance. But if you miss your second chance and you still don't make the timing, your journey ends there. You're sent back down to base camp, pack your bags, and off you go back home. Because it's too risky. They don't want a dead body on their hands. It just means that you're too slow, you're not fit enough, go back home, train harder, and come back again. Now, when we had about 20 sponsors who had actually believed in us finally and committed to support us through this journey, that was a lot of pressure. Turning back was not an easy option. So uh, keeping to that time was also quite a challenge. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So we now have this photograph here uh, at Camp 4. Um, so we go up to camp three, we go up camp one, two, three, and then camp four. Now camp four actually is known as the death zone. And it's known as a death zone for a very good reason. Because at this height, your body slowly begins to disintegrate or deteriorate. Because there's only 20% of oxygen in the atmosphere. And even though we are breathing with an oxygen cylinder is in our backpack and we have a mask, an oxygen mask on our face. You can see on the photograph, in the photograph on the left-hand side. Uh, it's actually 50% uh, ambient air and 50% from the oxygen cylinder. So it also means that your body is really struggling and it's trying to keep your heart and lungs and your brain functioning. So for example, removing your gloves for a few minutes can cause frostbite because it simply means your nerve endings and your extremities do not get enough circulation of blood. So when you remove your glove, it's exposed to the extreme temperatures. Up here, it's about minus 50 degrees Celsius. And that instantly can freeze your nerve endings. And you might, some people have had to amputate their extremities, their fingers and their toes. So, you know, taking your goggles off could also mean that uh, you can, your corneas can freeze and you can go blind in a few days, right? So there was no room for mistakes. Everything had to be perfect. And the training was essential, prior training. Uh, now, one thing I wanted to also say is that with that timing, when I mentioned the timing from getting to one camp to another camp, um, one of the days when we were climbing from camp two to camp three, it was a nine hour journey and I was too slow that day. Somehow I got to, I was uh, only two thirds up the way and I had another one third more to go on that journey and I was way too slow and my guide pretty much said, you're not going to make it. We have to turn back now and go back to camp two, go back down. Meanwhile, Johan and everyone else had reached camp three. And I was told, don't worry, we will get one more chance. But how can I cut down? I had to cut down three hours of my journey. How do I do this overnight? Right? And my biggest fear also was that if I did not climb Mount Everest and I came back to Sri Lanka, what are people going to say? What would many, many people say about women and mountaineering? Now, they, nobody understands the difficulty of altitude and lack of oxygen or climbing Everest. But people would have said, oh, you're a woman. Why did you even bother doing this journey? It's not for women. Women are too weak. Women cannot do such things. But for me, because of my, I guess, the studies, the learning, I was really privileged to be in a space where I would be able to understand when you talk about women's rights, what it simply means is that we're all equal. And I was taught that women are also strong. 
And that was really helpful to me because on the mountain, I had one more chance. And for me, that was a day I really learned about mental strength. And I think as women, we're often told we're not good enough. I mean, even though my parents told me I'm good enough for them, there are many others who will keep telling us, you're not good for that, don't do this, you're not good enough for anything. So having low self-esteem as women is quite common. Many women actually do have that. And for me on the mountain, I, my initial thought when I failed that particular day, failed the timing, I kept thinking maybe I'm physically too small. I'm, I'm, I'm five foot one and a half inches tall. Uh, on the mountain, everyone else, I mean, climbers from all over the world attempt to climb this mountain. And pretty much you can imagine American, Australian, Swiss climbers being like giants compared to me. And uh, even when they take steps, you know, my cadence is much shorter. So I would always think maybe my lungs are too small, maybe my size, I kept doubting myself. And then I had to just actually think back and think about the fact that for 13 years before climbing Everest, I had the technical knowledge, the mountaineering courses that I did, two months in 2003, in 2005, and climbing in about 15 other countries overseas when I would be sent on for meetings or conferences, I would save my per diem and uh, skip dinner, save the money, and then go climb a rock, climb a mountain in multiple countries, in Argentina, in the Pyrenees, in Spain, uh, Thailand, Bangkok, you know, multiple places, and all that experience mattered. And all I had to do was remind myself that I have the experience, I have prepared, but the one thing that I had to do was believe in myself and believe that I can do this. And that, something, that is something that Mount Everest actually would have taught me because the next day I woke up and I pretty much put one foot in front of the other and said, I can do this. And I made it, I made it to the top of that, to the next camp in eight hours. So I had actually cut down four hours of my timing. And then I think back now, I know it was like a little switch in my head telling me that I can do this. Despite everyone else telling me, you cannot do that. I had to learn to believe that I can do this. And of course, the, the, everything else also helped with that as well. So that is what really for me was, uh, has been life changing. And, and I'm saying this also because we all talk about thinking positive and having mental strength. I'm sure all of you have told either your nieces or your nephews or your children this multiple times. Um, and you have heard it yourself. Uh, and for me, before Everest, I would actually joke about it and say, you know, thinking positive is not for me. I would just say I'm a very negative person because my blood type is actually B negative. That's a fact. <laughs> but I would joke about it and say it's in my blood. I'm always negative. I can't help it. But now I have learned that, no, that's not true. And that if, as women, if we are given the opportunities, equal access to opportunities, we can also fulfill our, our dreams and reach our full potential. Right. So I'm going to continue to the next slide here. I mean, from this point, uh, this is the last camp and it's actually the highest tallest camp on earth, Camp 4. From this stage, actually, we leave at, at night. We leave at 8 p.m. Uh, I left Camp 4 at 8 p.m. and reached the summit at 5 a.m. So it took that long to get to the summit from that point. Uh, and this is a photograph from the top of Mount Everest on the 21st of May, 2016. And I have here a photograph of my parents because my father passed away in 2014. But for me, he was with me on the mountain and so was my mother because as I mentioned in the beginning, it was the support and encouragement that they gave me throughout my childhood. And you know, whenever I picked up adventure sports like rock climbing or surfing, my parents would just tell me, okay, do this, but learn how to do it properly and safely. Instead of saying, don't do it, or it's dangerous, don't do it. No, they said, do it properly learn how to do this. And that was a mantra that I carried with me and I'm very grateful to them because I know it's because of that support um, that they gave me, I could also climb this mountain. So there is a quotation that I want to share with all of you, which is a quote by Sir Edmund Hillary. Uh, some of you may have heard this and this is something that really resonates with me as well. Uh, it is not the mountain we conquer, but ourselves. And I'm saying this because very often people introduce me and say that here's Jayanti who conquered Everest. And I refuse to believe that. I did not conquer Everest. I did conquer myself. Because nature is, we cannot conquer nature. It's far too powerful, right? 
I mean, out there in the mountain, this picture of a bucket of ice, like lots of huge cubes of ice and some little black ants in there. And the ice is always melting. We were like those ants up there in the mountains. The ice is always melting. There's always a risk of an avalanche, right? Death was very real on the mountain. 11 people died the year we were climbing. So I definitely did not conquer Everest, but I did have to conquer my mind. I shared that example of having to believe in myself. And I, if I didn't conquer my mind, I wouldn't have made it. I had to also conquer our fears, my fears. My biggest fear on Everest was actually uh, seeing dead bodies of other climbers and also my own death, which was uh, which could have happened because uh, uh, it's also unpredictable sometimes over there. The year before we climbed in 2015, there was an earthquake in Nepal. Some of you may remember, which it also destroyed some of the, uh, the, the, the uh, some of their uh, historical sites. Um, and at the same time, it killed 19 climbers who were attempting to climb Mount Everest. In 2014, an avalanche in the Kumbu Icefall killed 16 Sherpa climbers in a couple of seconds. So I even wrote my last will before I went only because I did everything possible within my control to mitigate the risks. But beyond a certain point, we need to also take that leap of faith and live, live our lives, I suppose. And, uh, and uh, I mean, you, you can also get down, knocked down by a bus while walking on Gold Road. So sometimes that can be even more dangerous than climbing Everest. So it's about how do you manage risk and how do you take that risk? Uh, after mitigating all the dangers as much as which, which is in your control. And finally, I also say we can and we must conquer gender stereotypes. And I'm saying this because after climbing Everest, I actually, I didn't even know I would come back down alive. I didn't know I'll become the first person from Sri Lanka. And when I came back to Sri Lanka, there was also, of course, a lot of publicity, etc. Um, and I'm saying I didn't know I'd become the first person because there were two people climbing, Johan and I. Johan had to turn back. We were not together. At some point when he was on the last journey, uh, he had to turn back because something, his oxygen cylinder was malfunctioning and he had to turn back. And he went back two years later and completed the journey, which is fantastic. So he had the courage to actually turn back and try it again. Because with life, we have only one life, right? Uh, climbing a mountain can happen multiple times. So for me, when I came back to Sri Lanka, I think um, I kept wondering, okay, you know, why is it me? And I remember this is also a statement that the Sherpa people of Nepal, the Sherpa, Sherpa community, uh, they always say this thing, they say, you cannot choose the mountain. The mountain chooses you. And um, I keep thinking about this because immediately after I came back from Everest, I remember going and talking, sharing this story with uh, many schools, I mean, at many fora. Uh, and one of the schools in Kurunagala that I spoke at uh, with Johan as well, um, it was a government school uh, and they had students from pretty much like primary, like youngest, young kids to A-levels as well, from, I think from about 10 year olds till to 18 year olds. And when we finished, so Johan and I would usually share the presentation because it is also about teamwork of course and talk about this journey. But when we finished the presentation, these five girls came up to me. They were probably the age of 10, 11, and 12. And they said, Miss, we're really glad that you became the first person from Sri Lanka to summit Mount Everest. So I asked them, why do you say that? And they said, no, Miss, uh, because you have shown us that girls can also come first. So I said, well, yes, of course, <laughs> girls can come first. Boys can come first. Anyone can come first. Your gender does not matter, right? And what matters is that you're given the opportunity to practice equally with the boys or separately, but that you can also practice in something that you like to do. And then they told me something interesting and they said it very quietly. They said, no miss, our sports teacher always tells us that boys are always first and girls are second. So I was horrified because of course, we know this is not true. Right, Everest example. So we know that's not true, and many other examples, right? Uh, and these are stereotypes. These are sexist stereotypes that are still prevalent in our society. And I was horrified, but also really glad that these 
12, 10 year olds or 11 year olds were able to see that and understand that they can also follow their dream, that they can also come first if they put their mind to it, that their gender did not matter, that being a girl does not mean that they're weaker, right? So for me, uh, what really helped me climb this mountain actually was an ideology that I believe in, which is called feminism. Now, I'm sure many of you, of course, have heard this term, and uh, that I know also understand that there are many misconceptions about this term, and many, many, of, many, many people in society don't like the word, or they think it's a very problematic term, and there could be many feminisms, and I would like to share for me what this is actually what really helped me climb this mountain, uh, because this is, there are two definitions I would like to share with all of you. One is this one, a simple statement. Feminism is a radical notion that women are simply human beings, that we feel pain, we feel love, we feel hunger, just like anyone else in the species of human, and therefore we're all equal. At the same time, there's a, a, a definition from a mentor actually from Delhi. She passed away last year, sadly. Her name is Kamla Basin. And her definition of feminism is one I really believe in. So she said, anyone, anyone who accepts that discrimination exists in the family, in public, at the workplace, on the street, anywhere, and takes action against it, is a feminist. So for me, this was really helpful because, and it doesn't say only gender discrimination, it's anyone who accepts that there is discrimination, whether it's based on your gender, whether it's based on your religion, religious belief, whether it's based on your ethnicity, whether it's based on your caste, your class, your background, your educational status, your marital status, anything. If there is discrimination and you do something against it, you can also be a feminist. So yes, men can also be feminists. Anyone can be a feminist. It's if you believe in the principle that everyone needs to be treated with equality and respect and dignity, you can also be a feminist. So for me, this was really, uh, I guess, it changed me in many ways because when I was on the mountain, and all these voices in my head reminding me of what people said before I attempted this journey. That, Why are you doing this? Women can't do this. Nobody in Sri Lanka has done this. I had to remind, I remember what my mentors would tell me that, and many of them are really courageous women. And for me, that has been my inspiration to understand that you know, we are also strong. And uh, like, for example, when, we, when people say women are weak, I always say, look at the women in the TSC in our plantation sector. All of us drink tea almost every day, almost all of us, I don't. But we know that in the tea, in the tea plantations, um, I don't know if anyone would like to guess, but can anyone guess how many kilos does a tea plucker, actually the person who's plucking the tea carry on her back on a daily basis? 20 kilos, 20, right? Try carrying that on a daily basis and that is strength. And we say women are weak. We say women are weak, but who are the women in the rural areas who are carrying firewood on their heads? They carry water for the family in those huge, like those big urns, right? So women are not weak. These are stereotypes created by society and created by patriarchal societies like ours and pretty much all over the world. So feminism also is not against men. I want to make it very clear. There are many men in my life that I have loved and have loved, continued to love and care for. And it's not against men, but it's against an ideology of, I'll come to that. There's a, a, a little cartoon here, which will explain that in a moment. Uh, would anyone like to quickly unmute and just tell me if they see anything wrong in this photograph, in this, in this cartoon? Say, okay, gentlemen, next on the agenda, should we give women equality? As no women. Exactly. Thank you, very soon. Yes. So it's quite funny because there's a bunch of men sitting around the table and uh, talking about giving women equality, right? This is almost like our parliament, right? Or even the National Council, the cabinet. So um, this is patriarchy, which is an ideology. It's a society or system of government in which men hold the power and women are excluded from that, deliberately excluded. So what I want to talk about here is pretty much that challenging stereotypes mean we question these norms because leaving women out only means 
you're not allowing the full society to reach its full potential. You're cutting out some people and putting them into a box and saying, you can only do this for your studies. You can only do this kind of job. You have to get married at this age and you have to have children at this stage, all these rules. And those rules are there for men also, of course. You have to be the breadwinner of the family. The man always has to be the breadwinner. So there, these are all these rules that society creates. But I always say society is all of us. You, myself, everyone you know in your circles outside. And if society created these rules, then we as society must also break these rules and challenge them and question them. Because even on Everest, for example, when I was climbing this, uh, when I was climbing Everest, you know, the mountaineering suit that I wore was actually, I'm an extra small women's size. And I searched the global market to find a suit that would fit me. The global market in the US, Australia, UK. I'm not saying Sri Lankan doesn't even have this item. But they do not manufacture suits to fit women. The smallest size I could find was a men's extra small suit, which was far too big for me, as you can see. And this is what keeps you alive on the mountain. Even the boots that you're wearing, basically that I'm wearing here, they were two sizes too big for me because they do not manufacture gear for women. So the playing field was uneven. I had to therefore then deal with that as well, having clothes that did not fit me because it's a gendered world that we are all in. And this is my last slide here that I would like to share. So bear with me, I can see a hand raised. Bear with me with this last slide and then we can stop after that. Um, so this is actually a poster that when I came back, uh, the hashtag generation who are a fantastic tech savvy sort of group of young people uh, who work in all three languages. Um, what they have said is, Piriminta, uh, hold on, let's see what they, yeah, Pirimilamai, I'll just say it in Sinhalese and then it translate it. Pirimilamai ipudana dawase indala gehanu na meek wage kiela hagan eka apaha seya kiai kiela vena rataka. Everest can the Talanaker, Palin Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka Kabu Giant to get out of the way. So, from the day we are, they are born, boys are taught that being like a girl is a shameful thing. Girls, boys are said, oh, don't cry like a girl, don't throw a ball like a girl, don't run like a girl, right? As you all know, in such a country, we are proud that the first Sri Lankan to summit Everest be a giant. So, on that note, I would like to wish all of you. The strength and courage that Johan and I both needed to climb this mountain. I wish all of you to have that same strength and courage to climb your own mountains, metaphorically. Uh, and you know, you know, our life is also a big mountain. So all the best and thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jayanti. That was awesome, as always. Really, really wonderful. Thank you. Um, so, I'm seeing the chat box, yes. So, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. There was also somebody called Champa. Uh, you had your hand raised. Is there a question you would like to ask? Uh, yes. Um, I uh, First, th thanks for a wonderful, inspiring talk. Um, I have an observation that I have noticed over the years that, you know, as much as we try to, you know, reach, uh, reach out and challenge ourselves, I'm finding that a lot of women, uh, by observation, uh, set the standard as uh, to see what do men achieve and let's achieve what the men are achieving, you know, and even also try to emulate them like here in the U.S., uh, you know, for example, our business suits emulate what the men wear, you know? Mm -hmm. So my uh, challenge to our women is, why don't we become the best woman we can be, you know, rather than setting our standards as to equal, uh, to make ourselves equal to the men, you know? Be make a, uh, challenge ourselves to be the best woman we can be, you know? We don't have to uh, set the men's bar as our standards, if you get what I mean, you know? Absolutely. Yes, yes. Thank you, uh, Champa, for that uh, comment and observation. I, I agree. I mean, I think there are lots of pressures that women also face in society. And uh, now even Everest, many people might think, oh, I was trying to show that I can do better than men. 
but no it's, for me it's a personal journey i love climbing mountains and i will keep climbing till the, till the day i die and um, what happened happened right but for me it's just you know in terms of we all need to what i'm what i'm trying to say is that uh, when we talk about equality equal access to opportunities now i am also sri lanka became the fourth country in the world where a woman climbed everest before a man only the fourth country in the world 5000 odd people have climbed everest up to now about 400 i was a 419th woman in 2016 so for me with that statistic what it shows is how much access you girls get at home in schools to go hiking camping trekking i had those opportunities but even when i was in school i remember my friends did not get permission just to go for one night to singharaja forest that is where the discrimination begins the access to opportunity right so for me because i had that privilege and opportunities and i didn't have to face that stereotype from home i was able to pretty much like go get to the top of the world <laughs> literally also uh, but um, many girls are denied that how many girls are taken out of school right when they have money only for one child the girl is told stay at home and do the cooking and cleaning what happens to her right to education right she why she wants to be an engineer she wants to go to space how many uh, women are how many how, how often do we encourage women so in the business sector what often happens i think is sometimes women feel if we be like men then we'll get the same respect because again there are notions that as a woman boss or oh, you're terrible you're very bossy and you know, you can be really like if you work really long hours you can yeah. be seen as you're not thinking of your family but a man working late hours or oh, he's so committed to his work what a wonderful employee right so these are also stereotypes and that's what i say that we need to question those okay yes. i'll stop there because i see a few more hands raised yes uh, mr ramzi naziz please go ahead sir uh, thank you jayanti this is uh... i'm not going to talk on uh, on women's rights or their strengths and uh, and and their weaknesses uh, i teach i teach in a in an in an uh, in an uh, and a muslim school for girls where there are other communities and i know how strong they can they can be and what the new generation is going to be but my question is more on on you know on the mount everest i was just thinking uh, is is that is the top of mount everest a flat a flat place where you can sort of you know move around hang around wait for some time or is it just a shop i was thinking maybe it's just a, a small area where you have to stay there take a few yes. photographs and then start climbing down yes actually it thank is you. thank you for that question uh, mr ramzi it is a smallish area it would be pretty much the size of like let's say a table tennis table uh, and it is actually a peak so it's interesting because the border between tibet and nepal crosses right over the summit so at one point you could stand with one foot in tibet and one foot in nepal uh, and it's not too small it's not too big at all and uh, we were we could stay there maximum i remember staying there for about 20 minutes only because your oxygen cylinder has a limited it's got only 10 hours of oxygen so before that runs out we need to go back down as well so 20 minutes was a maximum amount of time and the summit itself of course was beautiful um it just there were just clouds below me because we were above the clouds we were at an altitude of 29000 feet which is i think it's called the stratosphere right that's i mean a plane cruises at 31000 feet so except here i was on my feet and not inside a plane so uh, it's a it's a small summit so the, and i was fortunate because i was also the slowest in my team being the physically smallest so when we left uh, camp 4 we left one hour earlier before everyone else to try and get there in time and at that time luckily there were only four other people at the top so it wasn't too crowded uh, i was very fortunate that that's Thank great you. you know i mean how you can you can explain and show us photographs uh, till the cows come home but you know you you really yes. can't <laughs> we really can't <laughs> see that the terror the fright uh, the, the 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 trepidation yeah. and the, so you know everybody it's, it's fantastic i mean uh, congratulations and you know uh, great job done and i i personally feel that 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 the government has not recognized you enough uh, uh <laughs> there are the wrong people in the in the limelight yeah no all that's i will yeah but thank you so much i didn't climb for all of that but i understand what you say many have said that but thank Thanks, you yeah. so much for those comments um sorry there's mr reza would you like to ask your question 
Hi, hi, Jayanti. Well done and amazing. I think I have listened to you in several forums. I work for Hamas. Okay. Right. I work for about three female bosses. They are brilliant, amazing. Kasturi. Okay, fantastic. Yes. Yes, <laughs> I directly report to Kasturi. Oh, and uh, so it was an amazing experience working with them for so long. Well done and amazing. One question I need to ask. How do you keep the saturation on a proper way while you go up? Now your oxygen saturation, like when it comes to the base camp, it <laughs> gradually drops down your saturation. Mm. Yeah, it, it may go down to 88, 86 or whatever. How do you right. keep it up? Is there, is there any, uh, do you get the medical support or in case of an emergency, how do you do it? What are the, if you, if I can, if you can explain to me. Yes. Are you, are you a doctor by any chance, uh, Mr. Riza? Because uh, you had very technical terms. So as a non-technical, uh, I'm, I'm medical side, I'm not uh, obviously that familiar. But basically what's interesting is that our bodies naturally adapt to the lower levels of oxygen. If you give the time that it needs, which is why this is a two-month journey. So remember I said once it takes two weeks to get to base camp, where there's... By the, by the time we reach base camp, we are already slowly, our bodies are now acclimatizing, which means getting used to, sorry, did you want to say something you had? No, but uh, basically our bodies are getting used to those lower uh, levels of oxygen in the atmosphere. So what happens is that when we climb up and sleep low, there's a principle, mountaineering principle called climb high, sleep low. And remember, remember I said we keep going up and coming back down. Uh, up to camp one, back to base camp, up to camp two, back to base camp. In that process, our bodies actually produce these red blood, extra red blood cells, more than you would have at sea level. And that means that even though there's less oxygen, we have more hemoglobin, so there's more circulation of blood. Essentially, what happens naturally to us is what people like Lance Armstrong do, unnaturally where they inject oxygenated blood into their system, right? I mean, he was called out on that, but some athletes do this is illegal of course but uh, i think it's illegal but here there's nothing of the sort i mean you essentially we have to acclimatize naturally and those who do not acclimatize actually have to evacuate so some i remember one person had uh, her, her, uh, actually yeah, his uh, eyesight was slowly beginning to get affected uh, because of the low pressure so uh, and he had to be evacuated somebody else had gastrointestinal issues so he had to be evacuated. So I think the thing is that if your body adapts, it's only then they allow you to take on the final journey, at which point we are now climbing with oxygen cylinder, which is like jet fuel on the mountain. So it kind of gives you that your body is craving for oxygen. It's basically struggling and trying to survive. And with a little bit of oxygen, uh, I guess it, that's, what, that's how many people go up and come down. But... Um, uh, so I hope that answers your question. Essentially, natural we use natural methods to ensure that the saturation of oxygen is adequate for us to keep going up the mountain and come back down without uh, losing our lives. Yeah, I hope that's uh, clear. Thank you for that question. Thank you, Jayanti. There is a question in the chat, and I've got a couple more questions as well. Uh, could you please tell a little bit about the training you underwent? I'm assuming that those trainings include mental preparedness as well. Yes. So, I mean, the training, as I said in the beginning, actually for me, I would date it back to 2003 because that mountaineering course uh, in that school that was for one month set up, the school set up by Thames in Norway, um, that taught me pretty much quite a few of the technical skills because you need, it's not just, you can't just be hiking and going climb Everest. You need to know high, about like all the symptoms of high altitude sickness. So that course taught us pretty much how to stay alive on the mountain. Uh, it also taught us like rope skills, climbing techniques, rock climbing, ice climbing, rescuing someone from a crevice, right? Very technical skills. Um, and essentially knowing the symptoms for high altitude so that you can listen to your body and turn back or do what's necessary if you are feeling those symptoms. A lot of climbers these days have no clue and they think Everest is a bucket list. They attempt to do this without that knowledge, the technical knowledge as well. And then they get into trouble because they are unaware of the symptoms and they keep pushing forward because they're also taught don't give up. <laughs> so there's a bad side to that, negative to that too, where you need to also listen to your body and know when to give up sometimes or when to turn back 
like like Johan had to do, that he wasn't giving up. He turned back because he was told if he continued, he would have lost his life. So he had the courage to turn back and come back home, train again and go back. Uh, then in terms of the physical training, pretty much everything. Uh, you, you need a full body workout. So strength toning, so, you know, regular body weight exercises, uh, push-ups, this, you know, scrunches, core. Uh, swimming is really helpful because, again, you can expand your lung capacity. So if you're, any of you are thinking of a trek to the Himalayas, even if you're a space camp, swimming will help because you can, you know, uh, holding your breath for long times or breathing in and out, breathing with your diaphragm, of course. Um, and then hiking, climbing, cycling. So it's a full body workout. Uh, mentally also, I guess that was the hardest part because again, we did not have access to anyone who could help us with that since no one in Sri Lanka had really climbed this mountain. But I think there's a lot of material online by other climbers. And I remember one of the main things, everything I read, everyone would say uh, a lot of people die on the way back down because you get to the summit and then you think you kind of you're relieved and you think okay i've done this but you have another 24 hours of walking back down when you're extremely exhausted there's no helicopter waiting to whisk you away from the summit you have to walk back down all the way to camp two that same day so it took nine hours to the top and another 24 hours to get back to camp two because camp two is where a helicopter can come and rescue you the helicopter cannot go higher than camp two because the air is too thin. So if you do get sick, then that is your permanent resting place. So I think mentally I had to also be prepared, I suppose. And that's why I said I wrote my last will because uh, I, I mean, I, I, I thought at least I told myself I would have a good view <laughs> if I did die on Everest. But, um, but the main thing was to climb up and come back down in, uh, in one piece and not to really uh, die on the mountain. And that also meant the gear that you invest in, find the best brands, one of the best mountaineering companies who wouldn't just take you because of your money. They would take you because they feel you have the training, you have the background, and they'll tell you to turn back if they think you are in danger, which is what happened to your mom. So a lot of factors in terms of training, all of that. Yeah, I hope that has answered your question. Thank you, Jayanti. Jayanti, just on this topic, did you have any sort of after effects or any lasting effects after the Dueling climb? Um, yes, after effects would be, in fact, I think because when you're in the death zone, your body is deteriorating. And um, what, what I mean by that is it starts to consume itself. So your body actually starts eating up all its muscles uh, because your di food digestion process has stopped because your body is like, food is not important. <laughs> you have to just keep the core functioning. Um, so it just kind of rejects food. So you will lose our appetite. But in that process, your body is consuming your muscles, and which is why we don't stay one night at camp four. So when I came back uh, to base camp, I had lost 10 kilos uh, and came back to Sri Lanka. It just meant I could barely carry. I remember going to a friend's house for a housewarming party and someone told me to carry two, two liter bottles of uh, Sprite or something. And I couldn't even carry that. I felt my, I just collapsed. My hands were collapsing. I couldn't, I didn't have the strength. So it took about at least a year I had dropped down 40 kilos at least a year to uh, come back to my regular weight and strength. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Maybe. Mr. Reza, do you have another question? Jayanti, uh, one yes. question. Yes. From Mr. here, from here, where? <laughs> well, there are many more mountains to climb. <laughs> That, uh, that passion will not stop, uh, same, same as my work, many mountains, even in gender equality, and many mountains, uh, physical mountains, and I mean, I love rock climbing, that's another sport that I really enjoy, so um, I'm trying to think of ways to develop it in this country, but keep climbing and teach others to climb and teach girls to climb, so we had actually quite a few workshops this year in rock climbing, and uh, we had quite a few women from the Muslim community, including Boras, who came because I created a space for women to climb or women only climbing space, just so that women could feel comfortable. And uh, so these women who came said that they felt comfortable to come in the clothing they were in and with no restrictions. And that was lovely. So uh, because women don't have these spaces often, they're judged <laughs> and told how to dress, how not to dress, what to wear, how to behave, how to walk. <laughs> so this was a space. And rock climbing means you have to really uh, use 
every single muscle in your body and sort of move your body in any kind of way that you have to. It's ascending a rock, rock using safety rope. So I enjoy doing that. Um, and I will keep sharing the story of challenging gender stereotypes. And uh, that's, that's the journey continues. It never ends. <laughs> Thanks, Jayanti. There's another question that's come directly to me. Um, since there's no access for choppers to the summit, is there a team of people in case there is any emergency to get one back to base camp? So uh, you have to come back to camp too, actually. There's absolutely, if you have to, there's really no two questions about it. No one has the strength to carry you camp, camp, because remember it's camp summit, camp four, camp three, and then camp two right you have to come down there and uh, there's no way around that uh, because so once you get to camp two of course and you're ill or you have frostbite uh, so johan had some frostbite and at camp two um, that's when a chopper took him back to base camp and i was trying to say i'm his timing partner i think i need the chopper too but they were like no no chopper for you you have to walk which I, it was a struggle another, another two three days to get back to base camp uh, so, so help, a, yes. help us understand when you reached the summit, you were all on your own, or was there somebody along with you? No. So the safest way to climb Everest is with a guide on a one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, again, that's trying. To, as I mentioned, you're looking at ways to make sure this journey is safe. It's not just getting to the top, but coming back down. That's important. Alive, not in a box. <laughs> um, so going after base camp, we have we are all assigned a guide, a high altitude mountaineering guide who's from the Sherpa community, a Nepali Sherpa. So he's with us. I mean, he walks about 10 meters ahead, but they know the route. And when there's a storm, they, they know what to do. When there's an avalanche, they would know what to do. And even if we are getting altitude sickness, they would know how to uh, keep us safe and like, either turn back or deal with it. So when I was on the summit, it was myself and my guide. So Johan and I had separated by this time because as I said, I was a source. So they sent me ahead so that I would make it on time by the time Johan got there. Uh, in fact, it's interesting when I talk about gender, another stereotype was that some people think that Johan actually sacrificed his cylinder to me. And that's why I made it to the summit. Oh. There's so much disbelief that because there was a man and a woman, there's no way she could have made it unless Johan sacrificed something, right? Which is not true because we were not together, right? I was sent an hour ahead. In fact, he even had the summit sponsor's flag because I didn't know I'll make it. Uh, so, so, so that's also interesting. So anyway, that didn't happen, of course, that we were separated. Uh, and I was very upset when I realized he didn't make it, but very happy that he had the courage to turn back. Uh, there's a question I see, were there women climbers? Absolutely. In fact, uh, I read one of the, there's a very well-known climber called uh, Nim Skurja, who's a Nepali climber, who's broken all the records in mountaineering very recently, there's a documentary called 14 Peaks, where he has climbed all the 8,000 meter peaks in the world in six months. The previous record by, by a white person, <laughs> a Westerner, let's say, uh, was six years to climb these same uh, 14 mountains. He climbed it in six months. And he has also said that in many of the expeditions he has led, women are stronger in mountaineering. So in my team, there were six of us, and it was only myself, including uh, three women and three three men and three women. Actually, it was myself and another woman who made it to the top in our team. The others, there was something that happened and they couldn't make it. So, and there are many other women climbers on the mountain, many more now than before. Yeah. Um, mountaineering is an expensive sport. Um, how did you cover the cost of this expedition? Well, I was, we were, I mean, very fortunate to have sponsors. At first, it was really difficult to get sponsorship because nobody believed that uh, we could do this. People just pretty much judged us by looking at us. As I said, I remember one person telling me, you're so tiny, how can you climb Everest, right? As if size matters. And someone else also said, had told you, you know, why are you climbing with a woman? Uh, but we were very fortunate eventually to get, uh, we had to just keep persevering and go after, get appointments with CEOs of companies and explain. And eventually we were very fortunate that there were 10 main sponsors and 10 other uh, slightly smaller sponsors, but many of them had to come together to make this possible because it's a very, it's a very costly affair if you want to do it correctly and do it safely and come back alive. If you go with a cheaper company, you may not come back 
I mean, that's what happens. People die because they go with cheap companies. Uh, but we were very fortunate that we had those uh, sponsors who supported us and believe in our dream as well. Yeah, fantastic. Um, Jayanti, what made you select Johan Pires as a climbing partner? How did the two of you become a climbing team? That's an interesting question. Good question. So when I came back um, uh, from Delhi, I mean, I, I told you I, had, I was doing the mountaineering courses only because that was one way for me to be connected to snow mountains and stay there and experience it and learn. Um, and I've been climbing since that time, mountains, rocks, all of that overseas. And then I was doing my master's in the UK in 2008. I came back to Sri Lanka. And in 2010, I came back to Sri Lanka for my master's. And that's when a mutual friend of Johan's and mine, she told me, oh, you must meet Johan. He's another crazy, he was crazy about mountains. And he's planning this trip to Island Peak, so you should talk to him. So then I reached out to him and said, I had heard of him, of course, he's a hairdresser. Uh, he's got his, he's a well-known hairdresser. He's got his chain of salons, uh, cutting station in London, Melbourne, and Colombo. And uh, so I had heard of him, but he was way too expensive for me to go to. So I would go to a smaller place. <laughs> but uh, then I met him when we, then I told him I would love to join Island Peak is a 6,000 meter mountain, 19,000 feet in Nepal as well. And uh, so he and I were on that journey together along with three other friends. And even in that journey, it was only Johan and I who made it to the summit. The others couldn't make it for various illnesses reasons. And that was on that journey. I guess we spent three weeks together during that journey and got to know each other quite well. And, you know, we both, like, I guess, kept each other going with a lot of humor. And that's when I realized that, um, and I asked him, would you ever consider climbing Everest? Uh, until that point, I hadn't really found anyone who thought it was something that you should do. <laughs> Everyone right. I had mentioned it to just thought I was crazy. So he was the first person who actually said, oh, that's an interesting thought. Let's give it a try. And then, then he would say, come to me for your haircut. And he wouldn't charge me. Oh, I love and, it. Yeah, so we would chat each time, one hour, once a month, I have short hair, so every month I would need a haircut. And we would chat uh, and uh, then get to know each other. Then we climbed Kilimanjaro together and realized, you know, let's do this together. Let's try it together because it's, 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 teamwork is essential. It's not a journey you can undertake on your own. And there were many layers of teams. I mean, the sponsors were also, of course, part of our team. So many Building up that relationship, I think, would have been really important. Absolutely, trust from the beginning. So yes, absolutely. Um, I have one final question. Is there anybody else here who has any questions? If not, let me ask this. I think my last question is actually a good way to end the question and answer session. Ajanti, what are some memories and unforgettable moments from this expedition? Oh, many. <laughs> memories and unforgettable moments. Well, I remember one night, um, uh, so I, I guess we have to also learn to pee in a bottle because it's so cold <laughs> and then you can't go out. It's too cold. It's about even at base camp. But one night I remember my roommate, my tent mate, she was an Australian climber. She just said, you have to go out and pee outside under the stars. <laughs> and it was just stunning. I mean, that night sky, freezing cold, but that sky is just unbelievable. It's, it's hard to describe. And even while walking through the Kumbu Icefall, I remember it's, it's stunningly beautiful. So it's also like the mountains themselves are majestic. And I would actually also communicate. I would talk to the mountains and sort of just say, you know, I would use the local names, Tangamata, Chamulungma, Everest is the Western name. But I would use a local name to say, if you come here to climb up and come back down safely, please let us do that safely and come back down. And you kind of feel like there are mountains all around you, you know, in your campsite. So you sort of feel the mountains are looking down on you and embracing you. Uh, but at the same time, there were many nights when you would hear thunder rumbling. And it's not thunder. They were actually avalanches where parts of the mountain would just come crashing down. And in the still of the night, you hear zips of tents opening up. And I was too scared to even open my tent because what do you do if an avalanche does come your way? You cannot run away from the car. So I would just hope that it would just go away. And we were very fortunate that we didn't have to face any. Uh, so very scary, uh, many moments of fear, but many moments of just wonder. Uh, 
almost on a daily basis, like a combination of both on a daily basis. <laughs> I and hope that you are efficient. To think you are just one of two Sri Lankans who have seen that, been there. Yes, you and, know? I, and, I, and I hope many more, and especially many more women, I do hope they will also uh, follow this part if they, if that, and follow their own part if that's something they would like to do. Yes. Someone has said, I heard on the way back there are fantastic restaurants. Well, the, on the way back, meaning after base camp. So after base camp, yes, there are these little lodges and buildings, but beyond base camp, we only, they are living in tents. So you're on a bed of ice, literally. Uh, no restaurants, and you kind of lose your appetite because of high altitude. It's hard to eat. Um, they make, I mean, there are like the campsites do have the dining tents, some of them, and in some places, of course, we have these packets of food, like from the military, which taste terrible, but we had to eat that if we wanted to climb nine hours or seven hours a day. So the restaurants are, up. if you are doing a trek to base camp, yes. Uh, beyond base camp, it's not the same. No restaurants in that sense. All right. Thank you, Jainti. Wow, what a wonderful journey we've just been on with you. A story with hope, a story with dreams, but mostly a story that led to personal commitment and achievement. You know, Jayanti told me not to say that she conquered Mount Everest, but that she simply climbed it. Because she states, and I quote, I certainly did not conquer Everest. I only conquered myself and my fears. And this reminds me of a very famous quote by George Adair, where he says, everything you've ever wanted is on the other side of fear. I love that. Absolutely. So thank you very much, Jayanti, for inspiring us and motivating us to always be the best we can be. I would like to now call upon the Secretary of the Women's Empowerment Sectoral Committee to offer her closing remarks. Sister Zeto. Yes, hi. Um, so, assalamu alaikum, everyone, wanakam to everyone. Uh, this might take a few minutes uh, because there's a lot of people I need to thank. Uh, so bear with me. And of course, I have to start off with the wonderful speaker for the evening, Ms. Jayanti Kurutumpala. Uh, thank you for sharing your truly awe-inspiring journey in conquering the top of the world, quite literally, in your case. Um, out of jokes, though, I must say I was really listening to every word and it was honestly so motivating to hear the achievements of someone who really went out there and conquered all her fears, her own pessimism, doubts and societal notions of gender, everything and attained her goals. So kudos. Um, and it's really, thank you for sharing your journey with us. Um, I think what I and everyone here would have gathered from Jandi's talk is that we can achieve anything and everything we set our minds on and here's to conquering ourselves. Um, and now I have to thank the persons who have been a driving force for the RPSL and especially for the women empowerment sector of the RPSL. Uh, of course, I must start off with our patron, Mrs. Saif Hanifa, for being an incredible pillar of support with each and every project we do. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Shabri Halim Dean, the president of the RPSL, Professor Aslam and Mr. Wazir Mikhail, the vice presidents. We owe them a sincere thanks for all the encouragement and support. Um, the chairperson of the women empowerment sector, uh, we cannot go without mentioning Professor Faziha. Thank you for being a constant guiding light and being so hands-on with all the projects we do. Um, and uh, Mrs. Hakim, the vice chair of the women empowerment sector for always being there behind the scenes and silently guiding us. And also I have to, uh, I have some special personalities that I have to thank for you know, specifically making today's program a success, our organizing committee, uh, Dr. Gefari, the you know, uh, administrative head of the consortium, so to say, for always being available to sort out all our Zoom needs and being ever so efficient and helpful. Uh, Dr. Shamila, again, a long-standing member of the consortium who has been very helpful and very approachable. Thank you, doctor. Uh, a special thanks has to go out to Sister Tassi uh, for pitching this very interesting and you know, truly encouraging project of having great personalities share their experiences with us and for getting us in touch with Ms. Jayanti, who really did a wonderful job today. Uh, Mr. Aman has to be thanked for putting together a wonderful poster in such short notice. 
and also all the other members of the organizing committee. I have to mention Sister Ajra, Sister Shabna, and Sister Shamla as well. Thank you for all the time and effort you put in. And of course, last but not the least, I have to thank all the members of the women empowerment sector of the RPSL and everyone uh, present here today. Thank you for all the questions. Thank you for all the comments. Thank you for being there. Um, so yeah, <laughs> thank you. Have a good night and peace with you. So there you have it, everyone, in a nutshell. Always have a goal, focus, concentrate with determination and commitment. Overcome the hurdles and obstacles life throws at you. Do not lose sight of that final stretch and never give up, but keep trying to be better one day at a time. We all know the famous adage, slow and steady wins the race. But I personally love this quote from Gautama Buddha, where he says, if you want to fly, give up everything that weighs you down. I think that is, in a nutshell, what Jayanti has accomplished. So on that note, let me thank you all for being here this evening. And to Jayanti, our best wishes for everything that comes your way in your future endeavors. And I would like to end with one final quote. I love quotations, just like Jayanti. The world needs dreamers and the world needs doers. But above all, the world needs dreamers who do. Thank you, Jayanti, for all you do, for inspiring us to make our dreams come true. Good night, everyone, and thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you, Jayanti. Thanks. Thank you, Tessie, and thank you to the RPSL as well. Take care, all of you, and good night. Bye-bye.